Hi there, my name is Vic Beer. I'm an ENT surgeon working for the NHS in central London. And my specialty is dealing with people with obstructive sleep apnea, snoring and things like that. So that's what I do mostly on the NHS at the Royal National ENT Hospital. So anyone can come and see me on the NHS for free and I'll be able to help them with that. Now, there is a condition that not many people know about known as Upper Airway Resistance Syndrome or UARS for short. And what this is based on is it's relatively simple at its core. It's based on increased respiratory effort causing disturbance in your sleep. So for example, uh, people know that snoring is simple like that. You just get air flowing past something and, and it's sort of flapping an area in the back of your throat, typically the palate or some other areas at the back of your throat. And then you go all the way to sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, where you go, you stop breathing, you can't breathe, your oxygen levels drop a bit. The body in its desperation wakes you up a little bit. You take a big breath, and you go back to sleep again, you hardly even notice this ever happens. And even people next to you don't notice it's happening. But you take a deep breath, you go back to sleep again, and then the cycle repeats itself. And that happens several times every hour. And that's when you end up getting obstructive sleep apnea. Now, there is a thing that some people say is in between the two, and it shouldn't be considered like that, is where you're not stopping breathing. You're not being woken up. What you're doing is you're breathing through a very narrow airway. So this is this upper airway resistance syndrome, where instead of you snoring and you're all, oh, sorry, sleep apnea, doing that, what you're doing is going, you're sort of breathing through this narrow passage. And that's great. You're not waking up. You're not um, losing your oxygen levels and having to wake yourself up for that. But you are working very, very hard, respiratory effort. You're working very, very hard to get air in and out of your lungs all night. And when that happens, although you haven't, you know, starved your brain of oxygen or caused all the other problems, you do wake up knackered in the morning because you've been working so hard to breathe all night. Now, the way to measure this increased respiratory effort, typically we use something known as a, a esophageal mammometry, where you put this tube through your nose, into your throat and into your esophagus, the, the, the gullet, the, the tube that runs from your throat into your stomach. And from there, it can measure the positive and negative pressure inside your chest. If you're going, <gasps> taking a really deep breath, working really hard to breathe, it picks up that pressure inside your lungs, uh, inside your chest, should I say. Now, that's really useful because it tells us, gives an indication of how hard you are breathing. But it's not very useful because people don't particularly like sleeping with the big thing up your nose and going down the back of your throat. Plus, it's going past your throat and uh, in this area here where people typically have an obstruction with upper airway resistance syndrome. So it can mess up that area as well. And because it's not tolerated, not particularly useful for upper airway resistance syndrome, we try and find a different way to work out exactly how to pick up upper airway resistance syndrome. And so some people have been looking at something called RERAS or R-E-R-A. S at the end. And that's based on respiratory effort. And so the way we looked at this in the past was it's a part of the obstructive sleep apnea side of things. So uh, there are things called apneas and hypopneas. Apneas is when you completely stop breathing, stop breathing for a period of time, take a breath, and that is counted as one apnea after a certain period of time. Now, hypopnea is the same as an apnea, but not quite as bad. You, you are still slightly woken up, aroused from your sleep when you get each of these things, but one is slightly worse than the other. Arrera is the same sort of thing. The respiratory effort is waking you up and causing an arousal which disturbs your sleep. And we... We don't normally count that when it comes to something known as the AHI. The AHI is the number of times you wake up with an apnea or hypopnea every hour on average during sleep. And that dictates if you have obstructive sleep apnea or not. Arrera is a bit like hypopneas and apneas, but not quite as bad as far as the, the, the classification is considered. And so therefore it's not included in this AHI, this number that determines if you've got sleep apnea or not. And what people do is add on the rarers onto their AHI and make something known as RDI, or Respiratory Disturbance Index. And what that does is that gives you a different value, which is often higher than your AHI. And people say, well, uh, my AHI is normal, but my RDI is very high because I've got lots of rarers, but no apneas and hypopneas. Therefore, I must have upper airway resistance syndrome. The problem is that rarers aren't a good way of picking up people with upper airway resistance syndrome. Because if you look at rarers, it's still based on respiratory effort, which is useful. That's what upper airway resistance syndrome is. But it's also based on arousals. And we're not talking about arousals when we come to 
um, UARS, we're talking about respiratory effort. So if you remember from esophageal mammometry, there's a probe that goes up your nose into your, uh, into your chest, into your esophagus, and it's measuring how much effort you're using for breathing. It doesn't ever monitor the number of arousals you're making. It's the number of arousals this effort is causing. It's just talking about the amount of effort you're doing. So why are we using rarers? Because they're based on the number of arousals rather than the amount of effort you're making. So I don't think it's a good way for diagnosing people with upper air resistance syndrome. And the other thing is that we know that if you've got lots of rarers, but not very much hypopnias and apneas, we know that people with these situations don't have an awful lot of clinical symptoms. So we've done studies in the past and you might have lots and lots of rarers, but it doesn't seem to translate to people feeling rather unwell. But people with upper air resistance syndrome feel dreadful. They feel tired, they feel sort of broken in the morning, brain fog and all sorts of problems which sound just like obstructive sleep apnea, but their sleep study looks normal. Their rarers might be slightly raised because it's based on respiratory effort, but it may not be that high. And people will go, well, doctors will look at this and go, rarers, well, we know that they don't cause much of a problem. What are you, what are you worried about? So that's one of the reasons why I think doctors will just go, well, we're not that interested in rarers because we know that rarers don't cause an awful lot of clinical symptoms. And because of this, and because people are using rarers in a way to diagnose upper air resistance syndrome, a lot of doctors will look at these people and go, look, I don't really believe you. I don't believe in upper air resistance syndrome. Rarers, I know, I've looked at the data, doesn't cause much of a clinical effect. So you're not sort of someone I want to deal with. And I think that's the problem. People are using the wrong outcome measure, the wrong measurement to work out if you've got the problem or not. I don't think you should be using it. So the next thing people do is look at flow limitation and flow limitation is quite useful. It's these little cannulas up your nose. It shows the amount of flow going in and out of your nose. Now, but what if you're a mouth breather? So it's a flawed system as well. What if you're a mouth breather? What if you've got a blocked nose and your nose is like this? Uh, it is useful in some cases and, and RDR I'm not going to say is wrong either. Rare is a useful Flow limitation, flow limitation is useful, but you can't just use that as, oh, this is the diagnosis. When you get to this level, therefore you're diagnosed with upper air resistance syndrome. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. The reason why we're using flow limitation is we want to see a flattening of the inspiratory curve and all those other things that we get from spirometry. But a loose nasal cannula in your nose isn't a very good test for uh, like a spirometry test, which is where the whole thing is just covered up. So it's an idea. It gives you an indication. It doesn't tell you exactly what you have and what you don't have. And so if you've got a really blocked nose or if you've got some other problem or you're a mouth breather, the flow limitation is almost meaningless. So you can't use it for that reason. So although rarers and flow limitation are useful, they don't give us a proper diagnosis. And in fact, we don't have anything really good. The technology out there isn't good for picking up upper air resistance syndrome because it's so hard to measure respiratory effort. We do have other things like pulse rate, respiratory rate, um, pulse transit time, which is quite useful in terms of the amount of time it takes from uh, blood to get from your heart to the, the end of your pulse. I'll explain that in another video, I think. Uh, and there's all sorts of other things. The thing I'm trying to get across is that we need to look at all of these things as a whole. And then you can look at saying, yes, that actually does make sense. This does look like upper air resistance syndrome. For example, flow limitation. If your nose is like this, then your flow limitation is going to be very high in all situations because you've got a blocked nose and no air is coming in and out. But if your flow limitation changes with position, that points towards upper air, air, airway resistance. Because if you're lying on your back and it goes up and lying on your side, it goes better, then you think, well, maybe it's your tongue falling back and causing up a bit of upper air resistance syndrome. And that's why you can get upper air resistance syndrome and sleep apnea at exactly the same time. It's They're not, you either have this or this. Sleep and biology is not as simple as that. Everything, all of these things interlock in this weird sort of Venn diagram, which we haven't properly worked out yet. And the reason why I like to use all the different indices to be sure I'm talking about the right thing is because I, again, you'll see my videos on how to read a sleep study. You can't look at someone and give them a number. This is how good your sleep is. It, it's like saying to a child, look, you're going to be this percent successful because this is your IQ. It doesn't make any sense to, to talk about success rate with a single number. It doesn't work like that. And the same thing happens with a, such a complex thing, such as sleep and breathing and, and how tired you are during the day. You can't measure that on one number or make a diagnosis based on one number. People should be moving away from that idea of, oh yeah, if you're over five, then you've got obstructive sleep apnea. It's a lot more complex than that. There are a lot more numbers, a lot more interesting data there than just that simple number. So what I'm trying to do is put a lot of research into trying to work out a definitive 
sort of way of defining upper airway resistance syndrome. So it'd be looking at you know, pulse transit time, respiratory rate, tracheal tug. Uh, the data I'm getting, hopefully going to get out of the X-Event project will really help because that's a great way of working out respiratory effort. And we have a, um, well, I, I believe we're making a wearable version. And, and I don't want to be able to power someone's breathing. I just want to be able to monitor it. So the uh, the friends I have in Taiwan are trying to make something like this as well. And my friend um, Jim Roberts is working really hard on the X-Event project. So hopefully that sort of information will be so useful in this topic of upper air resistance syndrome, give a lot more information. And hopefully with my uh, STAMP questionnaire, which you'll see some um, videos about, we can tie that into symptoms because that's really useful. Working out who gets a problem and who doesn't get a problem is really ha helpful for us because then we can work out, ah, actually, this person has lots of symptoms and this indice on his sleep study is going up. If we can marry the two, then we can start working out who has problems and who doesn't have problems. So if there's someone out there who wants to help me make this diagnostic kit, that would be great. Um, on the NHS, there's no money and um, everything's going slow for me because I've got lots of topics on my head at the same time. But hopefully I will get there in the end and, and I'll tell you all about it when it comes out. But before I end, I'll go back to the title of this video, Why Doctors Don't Understand Upper Air Resistance Syndrome. The reason is because nobody does. Nobody understands it properly. And I'm not saying that I have all the answers. I clearly don't. I, I understand it's difficult. And I understand there are a lot of people out there who are uh, struggling with this problem. And I think the more we go down this route of using sleep apnea data, uh, I think the more people are going to get pushed to the sidelines. So I'm trying my best to tell people that it's not about number of arousals. It's about the amount of effort you're making. We should be focusing on effort, not arousals. But you can tell by the way I'm talking so quickly that this is a subject close to my heart and I'll talk about it more in the future if this video makes, um, if anyone seems to be interested in this video. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Take care. Bye bye.